praise the Lord to you all on YouTube. Welcome to Upon This Rock. Today we're continuing a series of Through the New Testament in 2022. Uh, we're in Matthew chapter 22, starting in verse 1. And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables and said... Uh, and Jesus is continuing here uh, to shield uh, those with hardened hearts from truth. And this was really a, an example of grace. Those that he knew would not receive truth, but would simply just continue to reject truth, which would harden their hearts even further. Continuing verse 2, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king, which made a marriage for his son, and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Again, he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready, come unto the marriage. If you notice uh, in this verse, it says, Tell those that are bidden, I have prepared my dinner. So the invitation had already been sent out. Uh, in, in Jewish culture this day, invitations to events uh, were sent out prior, but a specific time wasn't given. Uh, the guests were to prepare themselves and await messengers that would inform them the time has come. Everything is ready. Uh, and this is, a, is the same as the invitation uh, that we've been given to everlasting life. We've been instructed to go prepare ourselves, be ready so that we're ready when we are called home. Continuing verse 5, But they made light of it, and went their way, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. Unfortunately, this is the response of many in the world. They hear the gospel, but they choose to make light of truth and go their way, heading towards destruction. Verse 6, And the remnant took his servants, and entreated them spitefully, and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. This is a prophecy of the destruction that would happen to Jerusalem due to the religious leaders continually rejecting Jesus. Verse 8, Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. The message of the gospel and the invitation to the kingdom of God is not just for the Jews, but also for the Gentiles. It is for any that will listen, even though we are not worthy of this invitation. Verse 10, So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came in to see the guest, he saw there a man which had not a wedding garment. And he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This man had came happily to eat uh, what the king had provided, uh, but he didn't change. He didn't have the love for the king and the honor that was due for the king. He was only interested in receiving whatever he could receive. This is alluding to one that is all about the blessings of God, but refuses to allow the gospel of God to change their hearts. Verse 14, For many are called, but few are chosen. Many invitations were sent out, but they did not accept the invitation. They did not choose God, so God therefore did not choose them. If we want to partake in the things of God, then we must choose God and his kingdom first, and then he will choose us. This isn't a flawless record, um, but rather it is a state of the heart. Continuing on, verse 15, Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. And they said unto him, their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Master, we know that thou art true, and teachest the way of God in truth. Neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of men. And the Herodians were a group that essentially worshipped Herod the Great. Uh, they offered Jesus a hollow compliment, a fake compliment, uh, in an attempt, a terrible attempt, to uh, get Jesus to let down his guard. 
Verse 17, tell us therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? They were trying to put Jesus at odds with as many people as they could. Anybody they could get to join their cause to stand against Jesus. Uh, the idea was that if Jesus had said uh, the taxes should be paid, that he would then be at odds with the Jews who did not accept the rule of Rome over them. And of course, if he said, uh, you know, don't pay the taxes, uh, then he would be in trouble with Rome. Continuing verse 18, but Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? Show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a penny. And he saith unto them, who is the image and the superscription? And they said unto him, Caesar's. Then saith he unto them, Render therefore under Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. Jesus makes it clear we are indeed responsible to God, but also to be obedient to our government. 1 Peter 2.17 says, Fear God, honor the king. Continuing in verse 22, when they had heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. The same day came to him Sadducees, which say that there is no resurrection, and asked him, saying, Master, Moses said, if a man die, having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Now there were with us seven brethren, and the first, when he had married a wife, deceased, and having no issue, left his wife unto his brother. And here they're basing this whole series of events uh, on Deuteronomy 25, 5 to 10. They were attempting to use this scenario uh, to, to show that the idea of life after death was ridiculous uh, and really just didn't make sense, uh, for they didn't believe in life after death. Verse 26, likewise, the second also, and the third unto the seventh. And last of all, the women died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife shall be of the seven? For they all had her. Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. And of course, not knowing the scriptures, they, they didn't have understanding of scriptures. And not knowing the power of God, you know, by denying the resurrection, all resurrection, the, the life after death, they were denying the power of God. Verse 30, For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. And of course, we don't fully understand exactly what heaven will be like in this regard, but this is not suggesting that we'll lose our identity or the knowledge of our family. In fact, in Luke 16, 27 to 28, uh, we see that the rich man is still very much aware of his family. Verse 31, but as touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read that which was spoken unto you by God saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of dead, but of the living. Here Jesus says that he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then directly follows it by saying that he's not the God of the dead. By doing this, he's saying that they are still alive and identified as the same person as they were on earth. This lets us know that the idea that uh, we won't retain our memory uh, or identity in heaven is not biblical. Continuing in verse 33, And when the multitude heard this, they were astonished at his doctrine. But when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him, saying, Master, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Trapp's commentary tells us there are about 613 commandments of the law. Jesus continually points throughout the book of Matthew to the spirit of the law. And if we love God with everything that we are, and we love our neighbors truly, as we are supposed to, uh, then we will walk in the spirit of the law. These things will be taken care of. Verse 41, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? They say unto him, The son of David. He saith unto them, How then doth David in spirit call him Lord, saying, uh, and they were 
you know, partially correct and understanding that the Messiah was going to come from the lineage of David, but they didn't seem to understand that he was also David's Lord. They didn't seem to understand the deity of the Messiah. Revelation 22, 16 calls Jesus the root and the offspring of David. Romans 1, 4 calls him the son of David and the son of God. He is both completely man and completely God. Understanding the dual nature of Christ is essential to understanding scripture. Uh, and this is how he's able to be mediator between God and man as described in 1 Timothy 2 and 5. By taking upon and walking in the flesh of man, he is able to be the ultimate sacrifice for us. But also being the one true God from the beginning, he can raise himself back up, holding within his hand all power over death, hell, and the grave. The following conversation is from Psalm 1 10. Verse 44, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If David then called him Lord, how is he his son? And no man was able to answer him a word. Neither does any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. Thank you for joining upon this rock. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and God bless.